he's fascinated with the idea of, of actually constructing things. He's very fast, and uh, when you know about a uh, one-minute manager, I would say he's a one-second manager. He's not one's typical Hong Kong uh, fat cat businessman. It's, it's not easy to classify. He's certainly different. No, he's not really different. He's more outspoken. He is one of the few people in Hong Kong who has got a sense of vision, uh, who's got a sense of humor. Some, some, some people think uh, I'm brilliant, some people think I'm an idiot. southern China. After decades of isolation from the outside world, the Pearl River Delta, lying just north of Hong Kong, has been transformed by 14 years of explosive economic growth, outstripping all the other emerging economies of Asia. Its proximity to Hong Kong has made Guangdong China's wealthiest province, with most of the riches concentrated in the delta. Its sleepy farming and fishing past has been overtaken by the enormous growth of its local manufacturing industry. At the center of the boom is Gordon Wu, an audacious Hong Kong civil engineer turned property tycoon. His one and a half billion dollars worth of investments in the region make him and his company, Hopewell Holdings, the biggest single foreign investor in China. He's guest of honor at the opening of this state-of-the-art air conditioner factory. It's just one of hundreds of local firms who stand to gain from his massive power station and highway projects. Gordon Wu is staking his future prosperity in the continuing development of this delta region. I think what uh, the Pearl River Delta will become is going to be the largest manufacturing center of the world because that has got the combination of every best bit. You have Western money, Hong Kong money, American money, European money, Japanese money, <clears throat> all the technologies, and the Chinese are willing to work hard, and you have the domestic market, you have the exports, and there's a climate and an environment where people work hard. He was one of the very first people who recognized the fantastic potential of uh, the sleeping giant of China. We, we saw the future in infrastructure, building power stations and building highways. Those are what uh, China needs. And if we can help China to promote its economic development, then uh, China will be very nice to Hong Kong. Gentlemen, you see the road bed in a minute. This is the road bed. Gordon Wu has made a lot of money uh, for himself and his shareholders, but he's one of those people who, uh, I think, um, is so enthralled by his own vision about how posterity uh, should should be like. <laughs> The world is full of geniuses and egoists uh, who have actually uh, benefited mankind. And um, perhaps you say that's vanity. Well, perhaps it is. You need an uh, e uh, egotistical man to have that sort of vision. Nothing wrong with that. But he, I think that he's a different sort of businessman because he, he doesn't sort of retains all the money he has and, um, and, and put it in a Swiss bank. I want this in rock and the economy of Hong Kong has become much more closely integrated with that of Guangdong because primarily of the export industries which have moved out of Hong Kong into uh, southern China, particularly into Guangdong, because uh, labor and land are very much cheaper than they are in Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong has employed in this joint venture factories something like three and a half million people and all these products will have to be exported, will have to come from China somehow to Hong Kong and put either on a plane or on a ship. Um, 
And um, to run these factories, you need power, and to transport it, you need roads. There is no national road system. All you have is, for the most part, poor quality two-lane roadways connecting cities, and uh, they're completely inadequate to the task. So they need so many roads to be built that there's no way they can build them all themselves, and they don't really have the experience or the expertise of building high quality modern roads. That's where Gordon Wu comes in. He's literally paving the way to future Hong Kong Chinese prosperity by building China's first six-lane highway. The toll road will link Hong Kong with Guangzhou, former Canton, reducing traveling times from some 12 hours to 90 minutes. What I adopt is uh, a, a simple solution. Always try to devise simple solutions for complicated problems. If there's a need, let's, let's look at how you can solve it how you can solve it effectively. Minimum cost, fastest time. Not a particularly smart engineer or anything of that sort. Uh, but he can apply sound engineering principles to work. He was known in the early days when I first came here as the man with the golden slide rule, as a man being able to buy uh, at public auction, the government public auctions would auction the land and Mr. Wu would be the man who would perhaps buy some of the most difficult sites because they would be at a cheaper price, but he would engineer solutions for them. And on top of that, we would build the buildings much quicker than anybody else and be able to recycle the capital that was employed on these buildings. So over a 10 year period, we became very, very experienced in the property development field. And, and that's what gave uh, Hope well its foundation. Right from the very start, speed has been an essential factor in Gordon Wu's success. He gets his edge in construction projects from a technique known as slip forming. Really just a very large extrusion mold that can uh, is built around the shape of the whole building and then just jacked up. The slip form method is not new, dating back to experiments in America in the 1950s. But Hopewell have pushed the technology further than anyone else. Initially, we were getting the apartment buildings organized and built very, very quickly. We changed construction techniques from what was an average of 10 days per typical floor of construction down to three days a floor of construction, which meant that uh, 30 story buildings were going up in 90 days and this had not been seen in many parts of the world before. jobs that we ever done was uh, this building we're sitting in now, the Hopewell Centre, which is 66 floors, where we were able to do on average of uh, approximately four days a floor for such a large office building. The uh, Hopewell was for, uh, in the, uh, 10 years ago, was the tallest building in Hong Kong. And at that time, everybody was proud of it because it was done by a local uh, boy, so to say. And, um, it was uh, 66 story high and for a few years it was holding the record in, in Asia. Uh, we are now working on uh, another building, that's the uh, Tower Hotel or Mega Tower Hotel, 91 story high, so that's over 300 meters depending on the size of the floors and we will have 2,400 rooms. He has started by I would say by accident, in the infrastructure business. He started building a hotel in, 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 in Guangdong, uh, and, and then he found that he needed a road, he needed power, he needed uh, all the things which required to, to get his hotel full. You know, whenever you talk about infrastructure, it, it's, you're talking heavy stuff. Uh, building roads is not usually profitable, but he turns it into a, a profitable business, and that's what enterprise is all about. That's what Hong Kong is all about.
most of the big Hongs or, or big companies in Hong Kong have uh, gotten in announcing big property development deals or factories or port developments or whatever. But Gordon Wu really started about, uh, about four or five years ago. He, he got into those projects at a time where uh, international investors were simply not making those kind of commitments in China. They were still waiting to see whether uh, China really was committed to economic reform. Well, I'm Chinese, so I want to help China. See, an economy is like a car, a cart. The car, if you want the economy moving, you got to, everybody must push. Now, more people push, faster the economy. But then, because of a lot of politicians who want to get elected, so what they say is, you don't want to push, I'll give you free lunch. You can sit. You can sit on the car and not push. So, very soon, more people sitting. Then these people will have to push harder. China, for the first time, adheres strictly to a market mechanism. A market mechanism, proven economic principles, you have prosperity. If you try to stick to planned economy, administrative, then you, you cannot have prosperity. The trouble with Europe and the trouble with America, I think is now too much planned economy. Some people say, take cigarettes. <laughs> I, I start listening to uh, classical music and I find that that is a, a tremendous uh, pressure relief thing. So I've been uh, a very keen lover of listening to music all day in the office, at home, everywhere. Actually, it gets to the point that if I don't listen to it, I can't think. It's Gordon's ideas, his personality, which give Opwell's uh, its identity. It's easy to get people who can execute. Difficult to get people that they can think. So I do most of the thinking. I mean, most of the ideas come from his own drawing board. And even though some of them uh, are not particularly well formed when they come off his drawing board, um, by the time they implement it, um, they do make sense. I'm trying to look at the intersection, how they approach roads, make sure there are no traffic jams. I would say that at least 60% of his time was on the drawing board and, and now with a computer probably still 60 to 70% he is still you know, feeding in his own figures, he, he, he'll always check his own figures. Yeah. Well, you've got to be hands-on. You, you, you try to leave it to other people and then, uh, they don't know what I want or they probably want to put in something that is maybe mediocre Maybe it's wrong, then it's going to be problems. I know a lot of engineers do have trouble working with him because he is very, very direct. But he, the, most of their problem is that they don't get to the get to the point. They they come without doing their homework. And uh, Mr. Wu is a man that does his own homework, and very often before. You know, when he's talking to someone, he'll probably have more facts and figures on the subject than, than they could ever believe. We don't want riders, what I call riders. 
A lot of people push the cart. A lot of people ride on the cart. Uh, I want the pushers. I don't want the riders. <laughs> our, our deadline is June 30th, 1994. I think if you come June 30th, 1993, you, you'll be traveling on some of the black blacktop roads. I hope I can finish every section, but I don't know. But I'm trying hard. Well, if I finish a hit, every day I probably stand to collect a quarter million US dollars. There's a lot of incentive for me to finish early. He's a visionary. I would describe him as more of an architect than an engineer. He's driven by a, by a vision of the future, which is very broad in nature. This is very unusual in this part of the world where businessmen Business people rather uh, tend to be more uh, oriented towards short-term objectives, tend to be more cautious. Uh, um, I think this makes him unusual. I've never been so busy because there's a lot of pressure for me to fin finish that uh, stretch of highway between Guangzhou and Hong Kong. And, and the only way that you can finish it earlier is to mobilize everybody focused on the same object and give no excuses but 120% of their efforts. The main difficulty is the sheer volume of work that uh, you, you want to do it in such a short schedule. But fortunately, the Chinese laborers are very, very good quality, hard working, and provided they get something extra, they are willing to work even in the middle of the night. You can mobilize them to work uh, two shifts or three shifts, no problem. Every time I had to go in, it would take me at least one day. I had to start in the morning and by the time I got to the city of Guangzhou, it would be late in the afternoon. And, and then coming back is another same thing. And it was a, a pain in the neck. I say, hell, you know, you, you, you don't spend that kind of time traveling that kind of distance. And so many people have to wait and queue up. They have to worry about getting tickets. But if you have a super highway, uh, even if you don't have a car, you can still always hop on the bus. A bus can leave every five minutes. You never have to worry about schedules. That, at the time, was regarded as, as a ridiculous proposal and it, it couldn't possibly work, uh, that there wouldn't be enough traffic, um, that it would be too expensive, that it would be impossible to cut through the bu bureaucracy uh, and that it was simply um, the, uh, the, the, the rambling uh, of, of, of a disordered mind that would come up with that kind of idea. In fact, when people look at it now, uh, it seems so obvious. Uh, that people wonder why it, it hadn't been thought of before. See, when I first went there, I tried to build, trying to look at China, and obviously the hotel we were staying in were very bad. So I said, ah, here's a opportunity, build a nice hotel. It was real rich in territory, you know, because uh, uh, China was closed for 30, 40 years. And we had a lot of argument with the uh, local official. Uh, we want to get a good location. They say, well, it doesn't matter really. This is a planned economy. We just place uh, visitors where we want. I say, this is not market uh, mechanism. Initially, it's difficult, especially when they don't know you, and that in 1981 was difficult uh, because of that. How can you build a hotel so fast? Why do you have uh, such big uh, food and beverage uh, operations? Uh, how can you make some money? Because they, they couldn't believe it because the economy was run differently. You know, the restaurants used to close at, at uh, 8 o'clock, you know. So I insisted on getting good location, and at the end, I won the argument. I said, if you don't give me the right side, I don't build. It uh, was real successful. It just became the landmark. It became the first modern uh, hotel of that size with uh, 
apartments and offices attached to it, and we were running 88% occupancy in the first year. Of all the hotels in China, China Hotel has the largest turnover, makes the most money, 25 million US a year. You ask yourself, where does he get the ideas? Because he is very often correct, you know. When we opened in 83, we opened, and in 84, there was definitely a boom. The people were looking for oil, the people were coming in, making joint ventures and so on. He had recognized uh, uh, that the uh, Deng Xiaoping had liberated the farmers. You know, the farmers could produce now and they could keep the money. And uh, he saw that the money was pushing into the, into the city and the city people would have more money and they would go to restaurants and so on. So I don't know how he foresees it, but he's right to the point, you know. China had been suppressed for approximately 30 or 40 years. And any country that you go into when the premier says we're going to have an open door policy is just dying to rebound. And the economy was like a very, very compressed spring. But while planning and building, I realized the energy shortage. You know, they're, they're, uh, although uh, people may find it uh, romantic with candlelights, I can assure you, candlelights without air conditioning is not romantic. So we uh, decided, uh, why don't we start looking at building power plants? One of the things that Wu did when he, in around 86, 87, 88, when he was really hatching his uh, southern China plans. He courted the top officials in, in Peking, all the way up to Zhao Ziyang and Li Peng, very, very assiduously. And he would have, and they treated him very, with great honor, uh, you know, which they do with uh, people from Hong Kong and other overseas Chinese who have a lot of money to invest in China. You, you know as well as I do that, 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 that China today is one of the most corrupt places on the face of the earth when it comes to you know, getting contracts for things. Uh, you know, and I'm sure Gordon Wu knows his way around. Well, I, I've been very honest with them. I've been honest with myself as well. I said, I'm a capitalist. I come and my intention is to help China develop. And when we are successful, there's a lot of money on the table. The thing that appeals to the Chinese about it is that somebody else pays for building infrastructure that they need. Although they do have a very a good level of foreign exchange reserves, they don't really have enough money to build everything they need. So if you have a company like Gordon Hopewell comes in and says, I'll build you a power station, then it's great. When I saw the need for uh, uh, electricity, and then the, I got hold of all the uh, directors of the company and we sit down and discuss. I say, look, this is a tremendous market. And can we do something? And of course, a couple of, couple of the directors say, we have no experience in uh, power generation. But I say, wait a minute, let's analyze. Most of the staff were not sure from a watt to a kilowatt, you know, let alone uh, when you got involved with building very big power stations. But once we laid out the facts and figures, and Mr. Wu is uh, very clever at making what seems a very complicated process down to a very simple process, and was able to lay out the, uh, the returns that would be possible from producing this power. We analyzed that most power stations, the mistake of people make in building power stations is they always take the civil fellow for granted. They, they, they are not even in the room during discussion. Most of the times, the civil construction is the delay. They have to make the foundations, have to build the structures and so on. Once you have that, you have to install the equipment. That you can plan quite well. There are enough firms in this world who are willing to supply you with boilers, single source responsibility, same with turbines, same with generator, and also the same with the conveyors and all these things. I say, if we can get hold of them together, but we, we, we do our bit on the civil, and I think we get the problem cracked. Now, what we wanted to do is 18th of April, 
As always, speed was of the essence. The first job was to create the 25 hectare site, most of which had to be reclaimed from the sea. Combining traditional manual labor with the latest mechanized techniques, Gordon Wu was looking to generate power from the station 11 months ahead of a 33-month schedule. More than $300,000 of early completion bonus hung in the balance. Yeah. We are rather disappointed. It did not meet the schedule as we wanted it on the 18th of April. We missed that by 70 minutes. You know, the public want electricity and it's, it's quite easy for us all to think you just turn on the switch, but somebody has to go out there and, and find the, the best site for the power station, where the water is, how can we get the coal ships, how can we do the foundations? Is it sitting on rock or the right or the wrong type of soil? The success of the first project has generated 12 new contracts throughout China. Using the Ford Model T as inspiration, Wu calculates he can save up to $75 million per plant by standardizing the units, but only if those early completion deadlines are met. Christmas Day, 1994. We're going to send out the first electricity. Now, the uh, Americans, they complain they don't want to work on Christmas Day. I say there's one way to do it. You finish it earlier, you can go home. <laughs> <laughs> one of the big problems, of course, in China, or everywhere in the world, is um, where do you get the money from to build all these power plants? That's the key issue, not building it. The, the way we operate is, is so simple. This is my equity base, so I put my equity here. This is the bank loan. So what the bank give me is this money, so I go and finish it. No, the banks don't give me the money because of charity. It's because I have the equity here. If I don't perform, they will take all that equity out. And if I don't perform, I can't get my equity back. If I try to pull it out, they say no. So my support from the banks is very simple. Every time when I borrow from them, I lose my equity. And I can only get back my equity on the day that I pay them off with interest. Then I can get it. And normally what I do is I find there's a lot of profit on top of it. And this profit is shared with the local authorities. And that way then I get the support of the local authorities I get the support of banks because they, they can see that the profits and the equity, all they are margins. And also I have a damn good track record because I truly treat the bankers as my partners. They are the preferred partners. It's the same, like the same uh, group of people who are very hungry. We go into the cafeteria. I told the bankers, please, after you, so they can go into the cafeteria and they get their plates filled first. I get my plate filled the last. There would be no problem in financing such a project now. At the time, uh, it was unprecedented. Uh, and this is typical of a, of a Gordon Wu project, that he, he tends to operate at the cutting edge uh, and, and uh, people d have to buy his vision. Uh, he's not involved in businesses that are, that are stayed and established and, like and well understood. The following gentlemen to take seats in a signing table. Uh, first, Mr. Gordon Wu, Managing Director of Hong Kong Hopewell Group. Next, Mr. He Bing Zhang. Signing the Deputy agreement Managing to begin Director phase two of the superhighway is a major achievement. Mr. His pioneering work in tackling massive infrastructure projects using private funding is a model that could be copied all over the developing world. Hong Kong and China are where his heart is, but Gordon Wu has moved further afield. He's currently building his second power plant in the Philippines and has started work on a highway, railway and mass transit system for Bangkok. Phase two of the superhighway 
will provide the first main transport link to the west side of the Pearl River Delta, and in the process, link Guangzhou with the Portuguese territory of Macau. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here today to attend this signing ceremony to construct the west side from Guangzhou to Zhuhai and Macau. We will pledge here all our resources to complete this road system so that the Pearl River Delta's economic prosperity will even scale greater heights. But for that, we need the support of the provincial government, every county, every district that our road goes through. And we have been assured we will get that cooperation. And we will get our bulldozers working as soon as the land is delivered. Thank you very much. Gordon Wu's success begs the question, why are other companies not doing the same? One reason is that it's hard work. Wu claims that it's taken 11 years of lobbying and gallons of fiery rice wine just to win permission to start the highway. And even at this late stage, problems dog the project. It would seem that uh, as part of the negotiating process, um, the word has been spread um, that there are serious delays in the project. I think the project has entered a critical stage in terms of uh, the balance between uh, benefits and costs. If we go to China, uh, it's uh, you give and we take. And that's what, what goes on in China all the time. Um, and he has the same problem. I mean, he tells me sometimes he comes back from, uh, from China uh, absolutely frustrated. And, 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 uh, but then he's not the man to sit down. He, he, he turns around and switches on his music and then he's back again. But uh, on the highway also, I mean, he has problems. We were under pressure from the Chinese side that they want a piece of the action. And I thought that building a road, which is very, very low technology, the Romans 2,200 years ago or started building roads already. So what's a big deal about building roads? So I thought that if they want a piece of the action, maybe this is a good opportunity. We can share the uh, experience and share the responsibility together. So I agree. And the bankers at that time thought it was a good idea too. But then after they send the people over, we find out that these people don't want to work. And, and we suggest and we insist on buying better machinery and they say, no, that's not the way we do. We want to do it the traditional way. The loss of confidence in the banking community was threatening the financing of new projects. Drastic action was needed. 150 bankers and 40 journalists have been invited on a whirlwind tour to check the state of progress for themselves. He's banking on his success in the past. His record of, of completing projects in time uh, that he is uh, showing the bankers around and say, listen boys, if you go with me, Gordon Wu and, and, and Hopeful, um, that's what we have done in the past and there is no indication that we do worse in the future. In June, what we have done is I raised this question. I said, look, this can't go on. If we keep on going like this, we'll never be able to finish it on time. So let's do a little divorce. I say, you people take the easy bit, let me handle the top bit. So that at the end of the day, we agreed. They took 40 kilometers, I took 80. Uh, I got all the, the tough bit. Yeah. 
He's been very imaginative in terms of his developments in southern China. On the other hand, if you look at the progress of those, I mean, it's been pretty slow. Problems with, with farmers who don't want to, buy, to sell the piece of land, or the farmer who wants to have this piece of land he can have, but that piece of land he can't have. With the Chinese contractors who have to do this and have to do that and so on. Frustrating. I wish I can just concentrate on engineering. That would be easy. <laughs> but unfortunately, I've got to spend a lot of time on other things. Uh, the big problem is simply dealing with Chinese officialdom, uh, which is bureaucratic and at some levels corrupt. You've got to be firm with the Chinese bureaucracy. When they come to a compromise of the standards, I said no. When they compromise on uh, safety, I said no. When they compromise on, they try to cut corner unnecessary, I said no. In other words, what I want to do is to do the job right. And that you cannot compromise. And if they're wrong, you criticize them. Don't just say uh, that they, they know that I'm, I'm not an ordinary businessman in that sense. The businessman will just say, whatever you want, I'll sell you anything. But I'm not that type. I say, I'm in for a long haul. If I do this highway, I do it right. If I do a power station, I do it right. If you make silly suggestions, I tell you, go, go to hell. With a degree in civil engineering from Princeton University under his belt, Gordon Wu made his start building apartment blocks and offices in Hong Kong. Operating as a simple contractor, he soon realized that the money lay elsewhere. In 1962, I saw the opportunity in real estate development. And then he asked to set up by himself. He asked for, for, for a, a mortgage. I say, Pa, why don't you lend me uh, uh, some money? You don't have to put out the money physically, but just lend me a guarantee. I can get the money from the bank. Whatever he does today is, in essence, an, an extension of his construction company. And if you talk to him, he will tell you that the only thing I know is cement bricks and, 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 and reinforcement bars. The rest I don't know anything about. I started on my own career with all borrowed capital against my father's guarantee. And that was the second most uh, risky decision. The, there was a bigger one right after that within about a week. I proposed to my wife and, and I think marriages are always risky business. And as it turned out, I think both <laughs> Ventures turned out to be very satisfactory. The French say, Cherchez la femme. There is always a great woman behind a great man. And uh, I think she gives him the support, and uh, she also uh, looks after him and uh, looks after the business, you know. Company is like a family. You know, most of us have been together for more than 15, 20 years. We started out with all young people. Now our sons are young people. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. How's How are you? Enjoying himself? Yes. Yeah. How old are you? Hey, Tia. Tia, 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 Tia,
十三十四啊！哎呀，你十四啊！Originally, the Wu family, that which began with my father, he he was born in Hong Kong in 1902. He started out as a taxi driver in the twenties, I guess. And then he saved enough money to buy in the half a share of a taxi and expanded there from so that by 1931, he already had more than 20 cabs. He worked hard and his motto to us is, uh, you must work hard. The only money that you ever enjoy is you earn it yourself. I think I enjoy what I'm doing. I mean, I, I shouldn't have any complaints, and I don't have any complaints. What I do is, when I see a problem, I went out and uh, I solved it. And in the process of which, uh, I also made some money, so. He's got the best of both worlds. He's got the Asian mentality and the uh, and the business approach, which uh, is very uh, very well renowned for the Asian people. But he's also brought along with it the experience that he gained in America, particularly with the uh, Princeton education. I saw the vast land areas of Canada and United States. I, and at that time, America was probably at its height. And I see the prosperity. I see what caused the prosperity because of the resources, because of technical superiority. Uh, and, and then I, so I thought, well, I, I, I better learn something from that. I warned my, my father about that, is that if you send your children to, to the United States, you must be prepared that uh, they develop uh, independence and all that, you know. I never liked their tax system. So I say, hell, as if they tax so high and they only tax 12 and a half percent in Hong Kong, I should come back and, and stay in Hong Kong and maybe this is better for me. Now the company is um, about 20, one twenty-two billion dollars. So we have grown 40 odd times. And now we own 40% of the company. Because what we have done is every year when we get the dividends, we just plow back and, and buy more shares. At a, at a guess, I would say his, his net worth may well be somewhere around 500 million US dollars. <laughs> We have extra money, that means you can allow uh, yourself to make uh, extra choice, even be able to afford a mistake every now and then. So in that respect, that is importance of money. And also with money, you can implement bigger projects. What I wanted to do is probably uh, build some highway from Guangzhou all the way up to the Yangtze River. That's a distance of about 800 kilometers. And if I can do that, and I think I can, uh, then we'll open up the interior of China to the coasts. You will be talking about uh, probably an eight, nine hour drive. Then you can have the uh, Yangtze River Basin, which houses something like 300 million people, have very, very good access to the sea and that the, the change, free flow of, easier flow of goods. I think we'll make a, 
a lot of economic sense. He's got a much broader sense now of, uh, of, of national planning. I think even when we first worked together, it was, it was a very narrow view of uh, property development. But I think now when, when, we, when we look at countries and we look at areas, we take a, a, a much broader view of these whole things. And I think his ability to have changed into that position, as I've always said, he'll probably end up as a national planner for China before he's finished. But I think this is, this is uh, definitely the way he is moving. Whenever it comes to political things, I walk away. Because I know my uh, temperament. I'm very straightforward talking, straight talking, and, and that won't last a week in politics. Politicians, you've got to be very smooth. Sometimes you have to say a lot of things which you don't mean. No, I can't do that. I advise them that you, be, you really want to see China strong. You've got to concentrate on two areas. You need to get your roads, harbors, highways, telecommunication, all this hardware infrastructure going, which is costly. And I also told them there's another area that is even more important and even more costly, and that is the software, which is education. I said, you've got to spend a lot of money on educating the next generation if we want to move forward. I came as a, a developer, as a promoter with capital, roll up my shirt sleeves and I'm willing to work. And at the end of the day, when there's success, when there's profit, I share with them. Or if they don't welcome me, who the hell they want to welcome? Thank you.